awesome. Thank you guys all for your generosity. Amen. You know, I've heard, I know we've heard it hundreds of times over and over, but you can't outgive God. Amen. He gave all that he had in his son. Amen. And uh, how can we not give back our lives? Awesome. You know, I know we've already said hello to Dr. George and stuff, but I'd love him to come. And I, I asked him beforehand, didn't want to put him on the spot, and just come and admonish us this morning and our viewers online as well. And it's great to have you. <laughs> Well, it's great to be with you. It really is. Uh, my wife is. Uh, she's not here this week, you know, but she's hurt herself. But uh, she'll uh, she, she'll she'll be back on her feet in no time. But uh, I want. I just want to encourage you today. You know, there's there's one thing. You know, with the, with the crisis, it's been a horrible crisis that's happened here. You know, with the COVID nineteen, these last eighteen months, two years, it's really been a time of confinement and lockdown, and and uh, and it's been a lot of heartache with sicknesses and also deaths and, um, and financial problems. But you know what? I, this is something, when I look through Scripture, I always see this, that beyond every crisis, God has a sovereign plan. You know, do you remember that? Beyond every crisis, God has a sovereign plan. All you have to do is go in the, in the New Testament, and you begin to see Paul's life. The Apostle Paul, he was either always going into a crisis or coming out of a crisis. But through every crisis and in every crisis, he always gave him a solution that brought advancement and revival. You know, so we can expect that, even what we're going through now. I mean, hey, the doors of confinement have been closed, but I tell you what, they are opening up real quick. Some countries already opened up wide, you know, and Canada, it won't be long before Canada is open wide. You know, and when it does, there's going to be something exciting happen. You know, really, you know, history has a way of, of, uh, of, of um, repeating itself. hundred years ago, you know, was, uh, they had the Spanish flu. And the Spanish flu, it, it, uh, it killed 50 million people around the world. 500 million people caught it. 50 million died. You know, and that was, a, that was from 1918 after the First World War, 1919, 1920, and then into 1921. And then in 1921, 22, it, it finished just like that. And then it went into the roaring 20s. And that was a decade of great, great uh, encouragement, great uh, product productivity, and great revival. And I'm believing that's what we are waiting for as well. We, I believe this is what's going to happen here. We've got to be ready. You know, I think during this time of COVID, we've been, we've been locked down, but we've been preparing. We've been planning. We've been dealing with stuff that we couldn't deal with before. We've had time, I know I've had time this last 18 months to do stuff I've never had time to do. And so what I've been doing is putting things in order and getting ready, and preparation is always the key. Preparation is always the key. If opportunity comes and we're ready and prepared, we can take advantage of that opportunity. Remember the Proverbs 6, it says, remember the ant. It prepares beforehand. And everything you prepare for, I'll send it your way. I tell you, that's a key. So, you know... Um, you know, the scripture in uh, Galatians 6 and verse 9, it says, uh, Don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you faint not. You know, this is not the time to faint. This is not the time to pass out. You know, it really isn't. This is the time to stay strong and come through this because there is a season of harvest. Your due season. Amen. Due season. And the seasons are changing. The seasons are changing, and it's going to be a season. You, we always have seasons of lack, seasons of attack, but then after that you have seasons of blessing and seasons of fruitfulness and seasons of advancement. And I'm believing that's what we are entering into, and I'm very excited. You talk about the Roaring Twenties. I believe this is the real Roaring Twenties, glory to God. That was the 1920s, but this is the 2020s, and we're going to have a great time, I believe, in this uh, Roaring Twenties, the new exciting, bigger, more powerful Roaring Twenties than ever before. And so praise God, keep, keep your vision, keep, keep your hope. You know, it says in Proverbs 22, 3, it says, it says the, the prudent foresees the evil and avoids it. The foolish passes on and is punished. You know, foresight is so important. Galatians 3, 8, it says, the scriptures foreseeing. It means you see beyond where we're at right now to where things are going to be. 
And if you can see where, we, where you're going to be, then praise God, especially when you know the future that God's got for us. It gives you hope and it gives you courage and it gives you strength right now. No hope for the future, no power in the present. Great hope for the future, great power in the present. And I believe that's where we are right now. So praise God. Great to be with you now. Thank you, Pastor Jason. And I'm looking forward to hearing you this morning. He always has a really good word. Great teacher, really is. And so uh, God bless you all. And I'll get back to you, Pastor Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man, as you were saying that, I just had that scripture come up, 2 Corinthians, where he says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphant procession in Christ. Always. Always. We might, we might feel like we're victims at times, but I tell you, God has made us victors in Christ. Amen. That's what victory is all about, isn't it? Right? It's all about victory. We have hard times, absolutely. But uh, we, we remain content and trust the Lord. Thank you, Dr. George, so much. Yeah, so we're on part five today. Uh, and we're finishing up next week of the series, The Holiness of God. And I know some folks are, are coming in a bit late in the series, but uh, don't forget that we have a YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and watch uh, parts one through three there. We do apologize to our online viewers this morning. Uh, technical issues, every church has them. Uh, we had no sound for the worship, so that's kind of a bummer. So you guys got to enjoy something here that they didn't <laughs> get to enjoy online. But hopefully uh, folks are joining us now, and we have the sound issue remedied. But we're talking about the holiness of God, and, and as I said, uh, the Holy Spirit really put this on my heart, this message, because quite honestly, I feel like it's been a topic that has not been touched for a while in the church. The fact that God is holy and uh, that we also as his people should be holy. And he has made a way through Jesus Christ for us to be holy. Isn't that awesome? And so God doesn't say, be holy as I am holy, and then leaves us without anything to do that. Amen? Can you imagine if he said, be holy as I am holy, but we didn't have Jesus? We'd be in trouble, wouldn't we, right? And so we've been talking about that. Last week, we said we have to begin thinking holy before we can live holy, because every single one of us, whatever we do is out of what we think. Right? Whatever we do is out of what we think. And Jesus said, for out of the heart flow the issues of life. Right? He said, everything in our heart, the mouth speaks it. What we do uh, comes out of our heart. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above everything else, for out of it flows the issues of life. Anything that you've ever done in life, start it with your thoughts, and then a thought becoming a meditation of your heart. Amen? Everything you've ever done, not stubbing your toe, but you know what I mean, anything intentional that you've ever done. And so we talked about how if we're going to live holy, we need to begin to think holy. We tied in Romans 12 too, which we'll also talk about today, that we're to be transformed by the way that we think, not conformed by the world, but transformed from the inside out by the way that we think. I wish, I don't know, folks, why God didn't just change our thoughts in an instant, like when we were born again. There's a process to it, to, the, to sanctification. It's like Varghese said this morning, our brother Varghese, you know, why didn't God just do this? Well, because he chose the church, right? He chose the church. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about, I believe it's in Ephesians, where it says God has used the church to display his wonders and his greatness to the principalities and high places. We are on display before them. God's power, I should say, is on display before them through his church. It's amazing. So God chooses uh, to, he has made us holy, but he's making us holy. And we talked about through the process of sanctification. Justification was through Christ. Uh, sanctification is, is through this life that we're living. And then, of course, one day we have glorification where we'll be like Jesus as we see him as he is. And we talked about how uh, many times, rather than capturing our thoughts, because we talked about last week about taking every thought captive, that many times we're captivated by our thoughts. And we talked about how we're going to turn that around so that we are the ones captivating our thoughts. Because we all will eventually do what we think. If you think holy, you'll live holy. If you think holy, you'll live holy. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is good, whatever is praiseworthy, worthy, think about these things, Philippians 4.8. So if you're thinking about those things, you will live those things. Amen? How many of you, how many of you found out real quick that you live what you think, right? And so if, if your daddy told you growing up that you'll never be nothing, anything, that's horrible English, then you'll never be anything, so do you, you, right? Because you'll live that out unless you change the way that you think to what your heavenly daddy says, amen? And so it's so important that we do that. So if you missed that message, you can catch that uh, again on YouTube. Today we're gonna talk about knowing the source of our thoughts, knowing the source. I, in order to battle our thoughts, in order, in order to fight this good fight of faith when it comes to our thoughts, we should know 
what the source of our thoughts are. How many of you know the old saying that says that knowing is half the battle, right? The old adage, the old saying, knowing is half the battle. Do you know what the other half is? Doing something about what you know. Because you can know a whole lot and do nothing, and that's faith without works, and it does nothing, right? But knowing, we're talking about here this morning, knowing is, it really is half the battle. We need to know what the source of our thoughts are. Where, where are these things coming from that we have to deal with them so much? And so we're going to look at this morning three things, the flesh, and there's two things within the category of the flesh. That's the natural, uh, our bodies, the desires that we have. There's our natural desires, and then there's us dealing with the desires of other people. How many of you know that sometimes people can put their, their desires on you? Anybody ever notice that in life? Hey, you have enough pr problems sometimes dealing with your own desires with the grace that God has given us through the Holy Spirit, but there's times when people will put their desires on you. Um, you'll notice that if you're in any, any kind of leadership, there'll be people that will come in and say, I notice you're doing this, but I think you should do it this way, right? And then you have to deal with the thoughts of, oh, are we not doing this right? Or we, uh, right? Those are other people's thoughts and desires. It's their natural. So those, those are two things to do with the flesh. And then the third thing is the devil. The third thing is the devil. I want to tell you here this morning that it's very easy to say that the devil made me do it, but I think you're going to realize that most of the, the trouble that we have in our thoughts actually originates with us and what is still in us in the sense of our natural desires. Paul called it the wretched creature, a beautiful, perfect, incorruptible seed of the born-again spirit in a body that has to learn, that has to learn and has to grow. It all starts with our thoughts. So one source is the flesh, uh, your own desires, the second is the flesh and desires of others. And the third is the devil. And we're going to look at those this morning in Scripture. So the first one is the flesh, source of thoughts, your own desires. And, of course, the best place to see that is James 1, 14 to 15. James says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin... When it is full grown, gives birth to death. I like the way the Amplified says it too. It says, but each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed, and baited. Isn't that interesting? And baited to commit sin. By his own worldly desire, lust, passion. Then when the illicit desire has conceived, which is in the heart, it gives birth, birth is action, to sin. And when sin has run, it cor run its course, it gives birth to death. And, of course, James is referring to Paul's words, which is the wages of sin is death. Amen? And so it really helps to know this. It really helps to know that a lot of the desires, a lot of the, the, the thoughts that we deal with are actually coming from our own desire. You'll notice in this passage that there's no mention of the devil. And, by the way, all around that passage, in context, there's no mention of the devil. Right? <laughs> Because it's very easy for us to think, oh, the, the devil is doing this and the devil is doing that. But many times it's actually us dealing with the desires of our own flesh, the desires of, 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 of the nature of the flesh that are giving us uh, thoughts that we can think, well, maybe I should have that eighth brownie. Well, no, you should probably only have two brownies. But your flesh is like, I want eight brownies. Your flesh a lot of times is like a little spoiled child. Has anybody noticed that? Right? When you're dealing with it, it's like you're dealing with a little spoiled, unruly child. And, and I think that's a great way to actually look at it. And we've been talking about in this series that the only way that we can rule over, we talked about ruling over our body, right, is by our born-again spirit. Your spirit always wants to do the will of God. Did you know that? Your spirit always wants to do the will of God. Always. There's no question. But your body and your mind... Your soul, your emotions, don't always, right? And so we need to be having them align with our spirit, our born-again spirit. So the first place and source of thoughts is your flesh. And I can, can I tell you guys here that you are with you more than anyone else is with you? Have you noticed that? You are with you more than anyone else is with you. And I'm saying that to say, so that means that the onus is on us to rule our thoughts, right? We can, we can have partners that are accountability partners and people that help us in life, and by all means, we should. The Bible says that love helps carry the, the, the burdens of others, amen? We should have people like that, but I'll tell you right now that you are with you more than anyone else is with you, 
Why am I saying that? Because I can't blame these desires on the devil. I can't blame these desires as a man. I'm just going to say it this way. There's some religions that blame it on women and how they dress. Do you know that my desires and me handling them, is the responsibility is not on the way that women dress. And how many of you guys know, how many of you men know, that it isn't likely to change in the world anytime soon for how women dress? Now, I'm speaking to the guys right now because God created us to be turned on by sight. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's my sight right now, right? Here's my sight right now. My grandfather said, you can look at all the beautiful flowers in the field, but you can only pick one, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? But Paul says, if you burn, then it's better to be married. Well, what is burning? It's a desire, right? So it's better to be married so that you can fulfill that desire. There's nothing wrong with that desire. God gave it to us, but it needs to remain under God's rule and the rule of my spirit. Amen? Amen? And I tell you that that's the only way you'll overcome issues in that area. You know what? There's women that can have issues in that area, too. We pick on men a lot, right? I've, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've met some perverted women in life. I have. They weren't Christians, but, man, holy smokes. I remember one girl, oh, her, the mouth on her, right? But it's, it's the desires. And when we allow them to rule us, what happens is we get corruption and perversion, right? And, but it all comes down to thoughts. Like we said last week, they're strongholds. It's the way that we think strongholds that build themselves up against what we know of God. And so that's our own desires. It's our own desires that we have. And I know, guys, I tell you, I have asked God so many times, God, why do we still have to deal with these? You know what I've noticed? There's not a lot of answers to why questions. Have you ever noticed that? There's so many why questions that we don't have answers to. And that's because God has already given enough in his word about what. And what I mean by that is what we need to do about these certain things. He doesn't necessarily say why about those certain things. Has anyone noticed that? The Bible calls that actually the mystery of iniquity. There's still a mystery to why we have to deal with all this junk. But I tell you right now that God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. God has given, the devil will try to get you to think. When I was a young man, I remember struggling with, with the kind of stuff I've been sharing. And I used to think, well, what's the point? What's the point of fighting? I can't do this anymore. And that was an absolute lie. Because the Bible says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is the truth. And this is the replacing of the thoughts that we were, we were talking about last week. Holy thinking will lead to holy living. But it's good to know where stuff is coming from. I want to tell you something here as well. The flesh cannot be cast out. It has to be crucified. You can't cast flesh out. Oh, Lord, I wish you could. Out of yourself and some other people. Nobody here. Don't poke your spouse. You can't cast flesh out. It needs to be crucified. Paul talks about that we put it, we put it off. We say no. What does Paul tell us in Titus? He says, this grace that has been revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ has come to teach us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions. Isn't that what he says? The grace didn't come to say, hey, you can do whatever you want and you're okay with God. But it, it, the grace says, hey, now you're empowered to say no. And so that's what I do because we want to give you guys practical stuff here this morning. When I'm dealing with stupid thoughts that I, that I know are my own desires, I've learned to catch them capture them like we talked about last week take them cap captive and saying father you know lord i take that thought and jesus i just give that to you i've also learned some practical things that when you're praising jesus it's a lot harder to sin you ever notice that if you're going through the mall guys or ladies or whatever and you have a bad judgmental thought maybe you have a lustful thought or whatever just start praising jesus and watch those thoughts dissipate right god has called us to be holy but it's good for us to know where thoughts come from so that we can deal with them properly and so we don't blame other people. I can't blame other people for my own desires. God has put it on me and given me the grace to control my own. How many even know that there's no gift of fruit of the Spirit called others control? There's a fruit of the Spirit called what? Self-control. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Don't believe the lie that you can't. I just can't stop. It's a lie. If you're a born-again believer filled with the Holy Spirit, even if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're a born-again believer, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. What did Paul say? His grace is sufficient for me. And if it was sufficient for Paul, it's certainly sufficient for each and every one of us. So number one is the flesh, our own desires. 
is a source of our thoughts. Number two, I mentioned is the flesh. Now, this is the desires of the others, of, of others, sorry, okay? So Matthew 16, 22, 23, we see Jesus dealing with this, okay? Peter takes Jesus aside. Of course, this is right before Jesus is going to be taken away and taken to the cross eventually. Peter takes him aside, and he begins to rebuke Jesus, and he says, Far it be from you, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Let me ask you a question. Was Peter Satan? No. What? Like, what? The, what you know, what's going on here? But he says, Get behind me, Satan. He says, For you are a stumbling block to me. Now look at what he says. For you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. The things of men are the things that are natural, carnal, and worldly. So Peter was genuinely speaking out of his heart that he did not want to see Jesus suffer. Amen? Obviously, he was. But in that weak moment, he allowed the devil to speak through him to Jesus. That's what happened there. That's exactly what happened. But here's what happened after that or what we read in the, in the passage there, Jesus refused to take the thought, right? He refused to take the thought. Jesus could have taken the thought and his heart been so broken about Peter not wanting him to go to the cross and being like, you know what, maybe I shouldn't. And actually, to a degree, we see him su you know, suffering through that choice in the garden, don't we? When he says, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, Right? Jesus offered himself up before any of us as the first living sacrifice, except Jesus actually gave up his physical life, and many of us won't have to. See, Jesus was given the opportunity to take a thought through another person who was being influenced by the devil. You see that? I'm going to be completely forthright here with you this morning and tell you that I know that there's been times when the devil has used me like that where I have said things to people when they said, I believe I need to do this, and then I tried to be like, well, I don't know if you have to do that, and I tried to, like, theologize my way around it, and I gave them a different answer. And I just felt like I was a tool of the devil in that moment because here I was trying to discourage them from what God told them his will was for them to do. Amen? And I, I went back to that person. I'll never forget the first time that happened to me when I know, you know, it was my own selfish thoughts. It was Peter caring that he didn't want Jesus going to the cross, but I allowed myself to be used by the devil. And I went back and I said, you know what? Scratch everything I said to you that day. You need to do what the Lord is calling you to do. As a matter of fact, let me pray with you right now about it. You see that? And so it, it is the desires of others, but sometimes on the tail of that or uh, uh, of another person's desires, the devil can actually use that. So going back to the first one very quickly, your own desires, you have them first. It's not the devil's fault, but please do not think that he won't take the opportunity to use that. That's why the Bible says, do not give the devil a foothold. If we couldn't give the devil a foothold, we wouldn't have that passage in the scripture. Giving the devil a foothold is when we have the thought, we don't deal with the thought and take it captive like we should in that moment. Then that thought drops into our heart. And our hearts are the place of motive and intent. Our hearts are the place that say, yeah, if I could get away with that, I would probably do that. Are you following me? And see, this is not to put anybody down. This is to see how it all works, right? Knowing is half the battle. It's knowing how it works. See, the Bible actually says that Jesus never gave himself over to men because he knew what was in their hearts. Isn't that interesting? Right? Right? And so we need to be careful of that, too. We need to be careful that we don't re receive a thought, like on Jesus' end, but we also need to be careful that we're not like Peter, that in the weakness of our emotions, we allow the devil to speak through us. Amen, church? Amen. Does this make sense? Okay, good. Because I tell you, when you understand this, it really, 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 really helps. But I want to let you know something here this morning. The initial thought is not sin. Amen? When you get a thought, it's, I know people that are like, man, I had this thought, and I'm like, Lord, forgive me. I'm like, why would you say that? They're like, well, I, I had this thought really quickly. I'm like, well, did you deal with the thought? Yeah, you, I did. Well, then it wasn't sin. Well, how do you know that? Because Jesus was tempted in every way, common to man, but he did not sin. And to be tempted, you have to have a thought. Hello. Ding, 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 ding. Right? So don't beat yourself up if you had a thought, and you're like, I don't want this thought. I don't want anything to do with what that thought was telling me in Jesus' name, or whatever, or if you just even just stop thinking about it. You didn't sin. 
But if you take the thought, remember last week we said you can't help the birds from flying over your head in the sky, but you can certainly stop them from landing on your hair, head and building a, a nest in, in your hair. And some of us don't have as much to build a nest, so the birds might be a little cold. But anyways, you can't help who comes and knocks at your door, but you can certainly help who, you can certainly choose who you invite in and entertain, right? So when you have the thought, the knock at the door, when you have the birds flying over your head, just deal with it at that point. Don't worry about it. But if it does get into your heart, thank God that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And John tells us if we have no sin at all, then we're lying and the truth actually isn't in us. Because when the truth is in you, it shows you the things in you that need to be dealt with by the Spirit. Amen? This is how it all works, folks. Jesus said, if a man thinks in his heart, he never said his head. He said, if a man thinks in his heart, lustfully about a woman, he's already committed adultery. So when you understand that, that's why it's so important that you take the thought captive in your, in your thoughts, bef in your mind, before it reaches your heart. Because the heart is the place where you say, yeah, if I could get away with that, I would do it. If I could get away with stealing t 10 bucks, 20 bucks out of the till at work, I would do it. At that point, you ask God to forgive you. Amen? And then you need to call somebody and ask them if you can give them something. Because we want to operate in the opposite spirit. If you have a thought about stealing, do you know what you need to do? Give something to somebody. And the devil's like, <laughs> The devil hates it when we act in the opposite spirit. Jesus did it all the time. The life and ministry of Christ is an example for us to follow of a man who operated in the opposite spirit of the world and the God of this world, the devil. Amen? That's why there is an antichrist spirit because Christ is against the world and the antichrist spirit is against Christ. Our hearts are the place of motive and intent. That's why everything we say and do in life comes from it and we eventually do it. So, number one, the flesh, your own desires. What do we say? Number two, the flesh, the desires of others. Uh, this can also be when somebody just doesn't like what you're doing and they come and tell you. Can I tell you something this morning? If you feel what they're saying is right and it lines up with what God told you and you have to make a correction, please receive that and do that. Amen? But what if what someone else tells you, how they feel or their opinion, or this is what I think I should say to you, and it doesn't line up at all with what the Lord has told you to do, what should you do with that? Disregard it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your heart. Right? The disciples' desire at the beginning of Jesus' ministry was that he would wipe out the Roman Empire and give the kingdom back to them. Wasn't that what it was? I think it was Peter, Dr. George, you probably remember, who said, if you want to be known, you've got to put yourself out there. Yeah, Peter said that. The what? His brothers, yeah. It says his brothers, yeah. Right? But Jesus didn't give himself over to men knowing what was in their hearts. Just being honest here. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Right? It's all about our thoughts. It's all what's going on about it up here and catching it here before it reaches here. And if it does reach here, thank God for his grace and mercy and his forgiveness. But I tell you, we want to learn from learning to catch things here more than uh, dealing with it once it's dropped here. We want to have preventative maintenance rather than clean up afterwards. But you got to know how to do that. you got to know how things work. I tell you, the devil knows how this works. He's, he's intimately acquainted with how we work. And by the way, God created us to work this way. God created us to have a thought and to have the mind of Christ and to have an imagination like Dr. George was talking about vision this morning, having a vision for what God has said and seeing it even before it happens. God has created us to work that way. But the devil comes in and he tries to pervert and to corrupt it and twist that's why Peter says, save yourselves from this perverted and corrupt generation. And the third one, I left him to last because that's where he should be. The devil. <laughs> the devil. Source of thoughts. Now, this can either be directly, although that's highly unlikely that the devil is personally coming and tempting you, or through the demonic realm, which he has rulership over. Amen? 
John 13, 2 in the Amplified says, it was during supper when the devil had already put the thought of betraying Jesus, look at this, not into the mind, but into the heart of Judas. So unfortunately from this scripture, we can see that Judas wasn't able to capture it maybe in his mind, we don't know. Was he premeditating this? Well, we do see in scripture that he was. I don't, but either way, at this point, we know it's in his heart. But Judas still could have repented of that thought and dealt with it, but he didn't. Amen? But the point is, is it was the devil who put it there. Now, I can tell you why these guys were getting the devil's attention at the time, because they were Jesus' brothers. They were his disciples. Amen? But most of us, if we can be honest, you're probably being demonically influenced. Thoughts. Do you ever get a thought that's just way out of left field? I've had the stupidest thoughts. I'm just going to be honest with you to, to hopefully help some of you guys here. I've been, sitting, I've been sitting around a group of people, and we're eating, and there's cake on the table and stuff, and there's knives, and I was over getting a drink, and all of a sudden I looked at the knife, and there was a thought that popped into my mind that said, take this knife and start stabbing people. If we're being honest, has anyone here ever had stupid thoughts like that just pop off? <laughs> see, almost the whole room. It's not you, so relax. You're not a psycho killer. <laughs> but he is. The devil only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come that they may have life and life more abundantly. The flesh profits nothing, but my words, they are spirit and they are life more abundantly. So what do you do with that thought, folks? Well, man, unless you want to end up in jail, uh, you need to deal with that thought. And I know they're not all that visceral and way out there crazy. No, sometimes, yeah. And I don't expect anybody to put their hands up about this, but I remember talking to a guy, he came into my office one time years ago, not from this church, but, and he said, I had the stupid, he's in tears, heartbroken. He said, I was in a group of children the other day and I had this stupid thought to try to get one of them alone and do something, just this quick thought. He said, I've never thought anything like that and I am nothing like that, ever. He's like, pastor, so I, just, I, I needed to come talk to you. Do you know what I taught him? This. I said, I'm glad you came and talked to me, but let me tell you that there's a way that you can deal with it right away without having to come talk to me. Now, he obviously didn't act on it, so he did make a choice. But at, at the same time, he's like, he didn't know what to do about it. That's just the devil, man. That's the devil. I believe there are times when someone, the devil did speak to them. There was a woman many, many years ago, I remember seeing the headline in the paper, her and, and, and kids in a car, and I'm trying to be careful because there's some children in here, but she, she felt like the devil, devil, the devil told her to drive the car off the road into a tree. They were all okay, but she almost ended up on charges of manslaughter because of her children in the car. And the, and the headline said, I remember reading it, the devil made me do it. Now, I want to be very clear that the devil can't make you do anything, but he can make the suggestion. Amen? Right. See, we will never change if we always put it on the devil. We will never change. It's all, it, it's, when it comes to me and God, I just want to say, it is all about me in the sense of I'm the one who needs to change. Whenever we put things on other people all the time, we will never change. If I'm always putting it on the devil all the time, I will never change. We recognize that these things come from the devil, but it still isn't the devil's fault because he can't make you do anything. Even the demoniacs in the scripture were still, be, were still able to get enough self-will to go out and cry out to Jesus and say, help me. Right? The devil. Judas could have refused to receive and act on the thought, but he didn't. He did receive it. He did act on it. Look at Acts 5.3. A few more here, and then we'll finish up for today. Acts 5.3. Some of you probably know this account with Ananias and Sapphira. Then Peter said to Ananias, no, no, uh, some of you may not know. I, I shouldn't presume that you all know. They had a plot of land. They sold it. Th a lot of people were doing this in the church at the time. There was a revival going on, a lot like Dr. George is saying is coming, which is going to be awesome. But the spirit is very strong and prominent during these times. He's there. And uh, so people were selling properties and bringing the money to the apostles and to help so they could feed the widows, they could do whatever they could, they could help the apostles on their missionary journeys, whatever there was need for. And Ananias and Sapphira thought, well, we could do this, right? Let's do this. The problem is, is that they sold the land 
but they only took some of the money and gave it to the apostles, but they agreed together that they would say that it was all the money so that they looked good. It doesn't say that that's why they wanted to do it in the scripture, but you can surmise from the scripture that they wanted to look good. We gave all. Right? But look at what Peter says here. Peter says, Ananias, why have you let? Somebody say let. It doesn't say, why has Satan made you? Come on, church. It says, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You have lied to the Holy Spirit, and you have kept some of the money for yourself. Now, we don't have the rest of the passage there, but Peter said, when you sold the property, the money was yours for whatever you wanted to do with it. You could have gave some and held some back and came and said, we want to give some from our property sale. And it would have been a blessing to the church and they would have kept their heartbeats because we know that they were struck down dead after that. But they let Satan fill their heart. That means they had a choice to not take that thought. You know, it's not just about the thinking, but faith also demands that we speak. Faith demands that we speak. And how many of you know that many times we also all speak what's in our hearts? Jesus told us that. And if we want to be speaking in our words and our life to be holy, then we need to make sure that our heart and our mind is full of holy things, full of this holy scripture. It says right on the front, right? Holy Bible. <laughs> but we need to speak it. Paul says, we have the same ministry of the spirit of faith that we believe, therefore what? We speak. And by the way, that was the words of David that he borrowed from the Old Testament, from I believe the Psalms. We believe, therefore we speak. And why is that important? Because many times confession and speaking actually reinforces our thoughts, so they work together. Even the world has discovered that. You know what, if you don't stop saying, I'll never be anything because that's what your father told you, then you'll never be anything because you're believing what your father told you. You need to start saying, I will, I can. Even the world does this. Amen? Even they've discovered this principle. But how much more with the power and the grace of the Lord Jesus and the spirit of God living in us can we overcome? Amen? Romans 12, 2. We already read this last week, but do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by changing the way that you think. Now look at this. Then, somebody say then. then. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So when will you know God's will? When you've changed the way that you think to his will. Right? That's when you'll know. We are changed by changing the source of what we think about. We are changed by changing the source of what we think about. It's that simple. It's not easy. Amen? It, it's not easy at all. Let's not lie. It's really tough sometimes. Can you imagine without a spirit, though? Oh, Lord. <sighs> but it is simple to understand. We are changed by changing the source of what we think about. Paul tells us here that we need to go from meditating on the world's ways to focusing on God's will. This is why Jesus didn't give himself over to men knowing what was in their hearts because they still operated as they were learning and growing under Jesus' ministry. They still operated by the world's ways. The disciples weren't renewed yet when they were first, you know, a part of Jesus' ministry. He couldn't do that and also follow God's will at the same time. Do you know, Paul says, if I was doing everything I was doing to please men, I could not be a servant of Christ. If, if I was doing everything I was doing to please people, I could not be a servant of Christ. Aren't those echoing the same words of Jesus that he didn't give, didn't give himself over to men, knowing what was in their hearts? Another confession before you here this morning, because I believe in being real and I believe that ministers to people. There has been times that I have given my heart over to men as a pastor. And I can tell you that it didn't go good at all. And I can tell you that there wasn't a drop of anointing on what I did. Come on. 
I wasn't doing what God told me to do. I was doing what someone else wanted me to do. God sent an angel of death. I'm not saying he's going to do this today, but in the Old Testament, to take Moses' life. Why? Because he didn't circumcise his firstborn child. Why? Because his wife, Zipporah, didn't want him to. And the angel said, you've listened to your wife rather than to, than to God. This is serious stuff, folks. And I tell you, there will be times when the will of God for you will look ridiculous in other people's eyes. I'm sure when you and Dr. Hazel were starting out, there was probably things that people thought you were crazy. <laughs> Your wife thought you were crazy. <laughs> you know what? Speaking of that, though, Patricia said, I never want to do that to you. Like Zipporah with Moses. She's like, don't ever let me do that to you. If you feel like we're supposed to do something, we believe in the godly biblical order of the home. She's like, I, I will voice my opinion. I will let you know. How many of you know that our wives need to do that? But she said, you're the one who needs to make that decision. I will never do what, what Zipporah did to Moses to you. Isn't that good? And I wonder how many people have been knocked out of the ministry because they listened to someone else who had in their hearts the interests of men rather than the interests of God. I won't lead well, you well, if I have in mind the interests of men rather than the interests of God. I do a disservice to you. Amen? And that's why I always tell you guys that Patricia and I, our life verse is Proverbs 4.23. Above everything else, guard your heart because everything that you do flows out of it. We'll finish with this. You need to know what God's will is in order to refute the things that are not his will. I'm amazed at the people that have come to me over the years and say, I just don't know what God's will is for my life, and they're, they're upset. They're, I just don't know. I just don't know. And I say, look, you know, this isn't to put you down or anything, but I'm trying to help you out. Like, how much are you in the Word? Are you doing devotions and things like that? And it's like, oh, man, I haven't been in the Word for like a year. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the way that you think. Then you will be able to know what God's will is. Did you see that? It's right there. Let's stand in this house this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, as you guys know, I say it lots. We're the doers. The Holy Spirit is the helper. So the Bible teaches. We're to be doers of the word. He doesn't do the stuff for us. He helps us. And I really felt today by the Holy Spirit that as, as we talked about these things, I said that they're simple, but they're not easy. And I just sense that the cry of our hearts today is that help. <laughs> help. Holy Spirit, help me. And he's always there. But how many of you notice that he still likes to be invited? He still likes to be asked for help. Yeah, have you noticed that? That's where he flourishes when, when, when his people ask for help. Say, Holy Spirit, I know that you're with me and I'm about to make this decision and I need your help. And you go and step out and make that decision by faith and he goes, great. And he helps us. So just with every eye closed in the house and you guys know we don't do that, do that to be religious. It's just, to, just so that we can be between us and the Lord in this place today. Holy Spirit, I thank you. You know, as Pentecostals, Charismatics, we, we, we always talk about the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, 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 and Holy Spirit, that we need that, absolutely, absolutely. But there's also times that we just need help ourselves personally. And Holy Spirit, you know that better than anyone. And so I pray right now, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you give help right now. If you want that help, put, put your hands out. Say, Holy Spirit, I want that help. I want that help in dealing with my flesh and putting it down and putting it off as the scripture tells us to put it off to put it down to crucify it Holy Spirit I thank you for your help I thank you for your help Holy Spirit fill me right now fill these folks right now Holy Spirit fill me right now Holy Spirit our helper our guide our wonderful counselor <laughs> fill us right now help us assist us the Greek says parakletos of the Holy Spirit. It means the one who comes alongside. The one who comes alongside. Holy Spirit, 
We sing that song, Kumbaya, come my way, Lord. Holy Spirit, come our way. Come alongside us this morning and help us, each and every one of us in this place. Lord, I don't know every need in this house, but you do. Holy Spirit, come alongside and help us. We can't give out of an empty cup. That's, that's, I know that's an old adage, but that's a word for somebody, either here or online watching today. You can't give out, out of an empty cup. I just sense a mother. You've been pouring yourself out and pouring yourself out, and people have even said to you, you've got to do something for yourself. You need to get some rest for yourself, and I can just see you even rebuking these people and saying, I need to give everything to my children. I tell you, if you give them everything and you don't have something poured back in, you're going to have nothing eventually to give them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you pour into that mom right now. Maybe you're here, that you pour into that mom, Holy Spirit, right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Holy Spirit, your power, your life, spirit and life, pour into each and every one of us today. We thank you for your help, Holy Spirit. We thank you for your help, Holy Spirit. Paul said to do everything in thanksgiving, right? We thank you for your help. If you're watching online today, maybe someone gave you a link and invited you to join us today, and you don't know Jesus. It means you've never said, Jesus, come into my heart, be the Lord of my life, and forgive me and cleanse me of my wrongdoing, my sin. If you've never done that, and you believe what you've been hearing this morning, you're like, I don't know what all this is necessarily. I don't understand it all, but I know I need this if that's you. And the Bible says that all you have to do is believe that Jesus really was who he, who he said he was, that he is who he says he is, that he came, that he ministered, that he did the miracles, that he raised up disciples and, and, and did all the things that he did, that he went to the cross, that he gave up his life on that cross. And on that cross, he took the sin of the world so that all would have believe in him would be cleansed and freed from their sin and that he really was in the grave for three days and he really was risen. On the third day, by the power of the Spirit of God, the Bible says, if you believe that and say that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. So if that's you, I just encourage you to say that right now, Jesus. I believe that you came, that you died for my sins, that you went to the grave, and that you were risen again so that I could be saved from my sins and have life through your Spirit. You are Lord. And as I always say, let us know in the YouTube comments here. Say, hey, I, I received Jesus today as my Lord. Let us know. And if you're in this place today, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Just say, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord. Only if you believe it. Only if you believe it. The Bible says we believe in our hearts. Oh, look at that. Think, believe, hearts. Look at that. And then, then we confess with our mouth. The mouth speaks the abundance of the heart. You will be saved. Father, we thank you for your glorious gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, God, in a changing world that it is unchanging because it is a message that has been birthed in and from you, God, who is unchanging. There's no shadow of turning in you. And so in all of this craziness and all of this confusion, we stay clinging to you. We don't stand on the sand. We make our stand on the rock. And everyone agreed with me, said, amen. amen. Yes, so we talked about a picnic because we're actually able to get together again coming up here. <laughs> Yay! But what we thought is we're just going to keep it really simple next week. Why don't everybody, if you're coming, if you want to, you don't have to. I'm being so, like, nice here. But anyways, <laughs> bring a picnic lunch. Bring a cooler, bring some sandwiches, whatever you want, and it's for you to bring, and we're going to have picnic lunch together with all of our picnic lunches that we brought. At the back of the building here, there's some beautiful elm trees, I think, or whatever they are. There's some nice shade. We can sit together afterwards. So we're going to call next week Fellowship Sunday, not just because of that, but we're also taking communion next week, and communion is a part of our fellowship as the, of the saints in the Spirit of God. Amen? So um, for those of you who are coming, there will be supplies for communion. If you're watching online and you're joining us next week, you'll want to have a, 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 a cup of juice and some bread or crackers ready at home to participate with us. What's that? Oh, yeah, you'll want to bring, I should just have you come and do the announcement. Anyways, you'll, you'll want to bring uh, camp chairs as well unless you want to sit on the grass. If you do, that's your prerogative. But uh, anyways, won't it be great just to just sit and share a meal together again? Amen. All right. <laughs> 
So don't forget, next week I'll send out an email to remind you as well. Love you guys. Bless you. Again, if you need ministry for anything, if you, you, you want to believe for healing in your body with us, we've got oil here. And please don't leave. But also pray with one another. Okay? Love you guys. Bless you.